one thing that I'm very excited about, and uh, some of you might have noticed as a new addition to uh, the DPM website, is the fact that we are now reporting summary scores from the KDQL. So as you know, CMS mandates that we um, collect uh, quality of life data and satisfaction with care from patients once a year. And uh, um, this is something that, uh, as you know, will be part of the quip moving forward. So I think that it, it's of great interest, and, and certainly DOPS has been very dedicated to assessing the patient experience over the years. So we have been collecting uh, data on quality of life through a patient questionnaire since the very beginning of DOPS, uh, so for the past 20 years. And one specific um, hypothesis that one could have is that changes in practices, as we are showing in the DPM, might have an impact on the patient experience. Now, we also um, understand and acknowledge that uh, questionnaires like the KDQL might not be uh, specific or specific enough to really assess uh, specific changes in, in how a patient feels, for example, uh, as his or her own clinical condition change. But given that this is the one instrument that, um, one of the two instruments that are valid, uh, um, endorsed by CMS, that is the reason why we are presenting the distributions here. Uh, and so this slide is just showing you uh, how to get to the quality of life data on the website. Um, so if you uh, click at the very top of the screen, um, you say download quality of life data. Even though this is a bit of a di different nature uh, of data compared to all of the other clinical elements that we that we provide and present, uh, we're interested in knowing um, who are the people who are downloading this data. So if you go to the next slide, um, I'm having difficulties moving forward, but uh, you will see this very, very brief um, kind of uh, form asking just your name and the organization you belong to. And most importantly, or more interesting to us, is the reason why you're interested in, in this data. And once you have filled out these four or six fields, then you can click download. And this is uh, the type of graphic that you'll have, that you'll see, and it's similar to what uh, Bruce was showing here. Uh, this is uh, the mental component summary score, so uh, the MCS. Um, the blue represents uh, the median, and uh, on the uh, x-axis, the y-axis, you see all the, the time points. Um, so one hypothesis again here was that perhaps specifically changes in uh, anemia management and lower hemoglobin levels m might have had an impact on quality of life. Uh, and um, this hypothesis is not supported by the data because, as you can see, the, the trend, there is really no temporal trend. So at least with this specific measure, uh, we don't really see any um, indication that there has been a, a change over the past 10 years. And then in the next slide, um, it's the same presentation with regards to the physical component. Again, maybe this, uh, this relates more to physical functioning and ability to perform physical activities. Uh, you would think this might be perhaps more directly impacted by um, lower hemoglobin levels, but again, we don't really see um, any changes over time. On the other hand, what I think is really interesting is if you look at um, the height of the light blue bars, that indicates how variable uh, the, in this case, the physical component summary score is uh, across um, DOPS participants. So for some, the score is very, very low, about 22, and uh, for others, it goes up to 55 obviously indicating the different functional status and the different um, experience, truly, of patients uh, in, in our dialysis unit. Um, again, we will continue to monitor these. Um, it, my opinion is that probably we need uh, different instruments to really assess the experience of patients on dialysis in our unit. Uh, probably a survey that uh, is as long as the KDQL is not uh, the best way to go. Also, currently, as you know, uh, it is not administered directly in the dialysis units, and so obviously there are some issues in terms of response rates. We
which we also acknowledge that is the case for um, the patients who responded to the patient questionnaire within the U.S. DOP sample. Um, so this might be somewhat selected uh, patients, although when we compare patient characteristics for um, those who responded to the survey versus those who chose not to, there are really no large differences, which I think is interesting per se. Yeah, so just, uh, yeah Francesca, um, just one other note. I mean, over many years, uh, the DOPS has been approached to, to uh, ask if we could provide benchmarking um, uh, or, or uh, distributions of quality of life data for benchmarking purposes, and, and we've certainly done so. But now, with, with availability of these on the website, we, um, we hope this will continue to be and, and become yet more a yet more valuable resource to folks out there. Yes, exactly. So, so um, I didn't say that because I was curious to see what um, the response to the reason for the question in the data would be for, for the majority of the users, but absolutely um, we envision this as um, perhaps a benchmarking. Obviously, we have, and each of you have uh, very detailed data on clinical um, variables, but um, there is really not not a good data source for what is, on average, the experience of dialysis patients in the U.S. And so obviously this just relates to these very specific measures, um, but we think this would be might be of interest to you in, in terms of quality improvement, for example. So moving on to um, the next clinical topic, uh, we look specifically at dialysis prescription and dose. Obviously, uh, one of the measures in the QIP relates to uh, dialysis dose, um, starting in this year, uh, specifically to uh, KTORV. Uh, the benchmark being, or the, the target uh, being uh, greater than 1.2. And as you can see, um, the proportion of patients not um, meeting the target, this is restricted to those patients who have been on dialysis for at least one year, is uh, relatively low, varying between 7 and 6 percent, and that hasn't really changed significantly over time. The median or the mean uh, KTVRV was shown, uh, is shown here uh, with the blue line. The, so on average, uh, patients are well above the, the 1.2 um, target. So obviously, KTMRV is um, the function of different uh, components, one of which is the duration of the dialysis treatment. Uh, we know that when managing or working in a dialysis unit, the length uh, of each run is really what has the greatest impact on the workflow. And so understandably, there have been a lot of resistances in the U.S. in increasing treatment time. Uh, there is no target per se, no CMS mandated target with, uh, re related to dia dialysis treatment. But um, analysis of DOPS data and other databases um, clearly demonstrate that in the observational setting there is a, an advantage for patients who are treated with longer treatment, certainly uh, those who are treated for less than three and a half hours. And this is, as you can see, about a third of patients in the U.S. overall. Um, the mean treatment time in minutes is listed up there, so it's somewhere between, um, you know, around three and a half hours or a little bit less. Um, one thing that we're interested in doing and continue doing is to see whether there is a trend to a slightly lower treatment time and if that is, is going to continue. As I showed in the prior slides, the issue of meeting the quality indicator for KT over V is really not an issue um, with the current treatment time. And so we wonder if in order to maximize efficiency, there might be a trend towards uh, lower duration of the runs, and we will continue to monitor this. Um, on the other end, uh, the other component that is a determinant of the KT over V obviously is the blood flow. Here we chose to show percentage of patients with blood flow greater than 450, um, and that is actually about 50% of patients. Again, looking at the, the international component of DOPS, these are much higher blood flows compared to what we observe in many other countries, certainly Japan and many of the European countries. Um, this is a, a way uh, 
that um, dialysis facilities can obtain high dialysis doses even in uh, relatively larger patients uh, with uh, the shortest treatment times that we observe uh, across the globe within the DOPS. Uh, so KTRV is not a problem. However, I personally feel very strongly that shorter treatment time uh, are relatively contraindicated in terms of, especially, in my opinion, from the patient perspective, uh, when we have to ultrafiltrate, you know, more than a liter, sometimes 1.5 liter per hour, and we are dialyzing so quickly, um, we hear from patients that uh, they're not feeling well when they go home. So I think we should take that into account even if uh, we are meeting KTRV targets. If you go to the next slide, um, really a quick update on mineral and bone disorder. Um, serum uh, levels of calcium and phosphorus have remained relatively st stable over the past um, 10 years, well, six years here. And phosphorus has been a slight decrease over time, but really no major changes. The next slide, um, how about the therapies that we are using? This is percentage of patients um, prescribed any phosphate binder in light blue, and that remains stable uh, through about 2013, and that there has been certainly a decline in patients pr prescribed a phosphate binder, despite the fact that, as I shown earlier, phosphorus levels remain stable. Um, vitamin D, this is any vitamin D, uh, active vitamin D, so 125, either, either oral or IV. It remains stable about 80%, although, as I, I will show you, the interesting trend in terms of administration. And then sorry, just Sinacal said, has remained relatively stable, around 28%. So going to the next slide, um, looking specifically at PTH, um, this is something that I think I present at every WebEx, but um, I think it's important. So we have shown uh, over time a slight increase. If you look at the median PTH, uh, it seems, um, you know, from 249, in 2010 to a median of 343 now. And it seems like in the past uh, few updates there has been a, a trend towards continuing increase, especially in the upper categories, if you look at the, uh, at the orange line. Uh, as indicated here, the, that's the 90th percentile, so 10% of patients are above that line. And that has increased about 30% uh, since 2010. Um, but I think also it's really important to indicate is that um, we now have large proportion of patients with PTH above 600. Uh, clearly, KDGO guidelines um, allow much uh, more liberal targets compared to the prior KDOKI, but um, all observational studies have indicated that PTH above 600 is associated with mortality and hospitalization, and now 15% of uh, known African American patients have levels above 600, and maybe indicating a disparity, not so much in care, but really in the physiology of uh, vitamin D and PTH secretion. 30%, almost 30% of black patients have a PTH above 600. So this is something I would encourage you to look at, especially if you work in a unit uh, with high proportion of African American patients. So how do we treat PTH? Obviously, vitamin D has been um, our first-line therapy for a long time now. Um, the different categories, it's either IV vitamin D only, and then the combination of IV and oral. And then I think very interestingly, in recent um, years, we have seen a, a large increase uh, of the oral vitamin D administration uh, with 36% uh, of patients treated with oral only in December of last year. Uh, in terms of uh, effectiveness, uh, it remains to be determined whether this will have an impact long term on PTH levels. Here we're restricted to active vitamin D only, so technically the IV vitamin calcitriol and oral calcitriol are the same compound. But often uh, patients who are being switched from IV to oral 
could also change the type of vitamin D that they were receiving. Um, so I think uh, we, it remains to be seen whether the control of PTH uh, levels will be impacted any further by uh, this, this switch of type of uh, vitamin D. Also, the other issue, obviously, uh, as we alluded to in the, the questions that we had for you, is adherence with an oral medication. So I'm really interested in seeing the results of the poll when we ask if you're using oral vitamin D, whether that is being administered at the dialysis unit or is it just part of the prescription um, of oral medications that the patients take at home. And I think maybe we can look at... Um, Oh, sorry, just one more thing in terms of uh, the type going, going uh, along, with the, along the line of the type of vitamin D. Um, as you know, this is largely based by contracts that each dialysis provider have with different pharmaceutical companies. So we clearly have seen a big switch from paracalcitro on almost exclu exclusive, exclusively used um, in 2010 to this much more um, different uh, scenario now with um, the patients uh, on oral vitamin D receiving calcitriol, and then 50% um, are on doxorcalciferol, um, and this is IV only, and then the, the rest paracalcitriol. So uh, even in terms of the types of vitamin D, uh, there has been a real change. And again, um, the issue of conversion from one to the other, what is the the conversion factor? Um, it's it's pretty unclear in the literature, so it's, it will be interesting to see what are the protocols using and and how do the, these changes impact uh, PTH levels. So if we go to the next slide, um, one other concept that I wanted to allude to really quickly and that is now shown on, on the DPM is this notion of the importance of controlling multiple um, markets of mineral bone disorder as opposed to one only. Uh, so uh, this indicates um, patients uh, with the markets out of target and the target are specified in the footnote there. Um, as you can see about one third of patients have uh, uh, optimally controlled MBD with all three markers in range, and then it's about a 50-50 split between those who have uh, just one of those markers out of range and two out of range. Uh, fortunately, uh, only about 4% of patients have all of these out of range, which um, has been associated with the highest risk of adverse outcomes. I think this is it in terms of the, the MBD trends. Really what I wanted to underline is this um, trend in continuous higher PTH levels uh, with especially higher levels among African-American patients. Um, now about one-third of patients uh, are using oral vitamin D, uh, whether it's at the dialysis unit or at home. Uh, and this uh, trend towards lower phosphate binder prescription even though phosphorus levels have remained, um, have remained constant. Now, obviously, these are trends as observed in our sample, um, so they do not necessarily reflect um, practice at every single dialysis unit, uh, but uh, we feel that our sample um, is it's representative of the overall of the practices across the U.S. And certainly, you were very interested if you feel that uh, this does not align either with your own practice or with your sense of what's going on more broadly, we, we are really interested in hearing about that. Uh, Brian, I don't know, did you want to look at uh, the, the answers from the polls now? And meanwhile, I don't know if there are specific questions that have come up um, yeah. that we can address. I think we're going to wait, Francesca, to the end of the presentation, all the presentations, to look at the poll questions. Okay. Um, so there was a question uh, about um, why uh, we might have seen this dec decline in phosphate binder uh, prescription over time. And I think I really don't have any specific hypothesis. Now, obviously, um, we we know that uh, for a long time there was talk about uh, including the orals in the bundle, whether that had any impact on prescription patterns. Um, it, it's open for discussion. The, the uh, inclusion
conclusion of orals that had been delayed. Uh, so this might have been in preparation of such, or it might have been just observing um, phosphorus levels. The reason I'm a little bit disturbed, I shouldn't say disturbed, but I, I think this is the trend that it's important to continue to monitor is that I would not want um, um, patients to be prescribed um, tighter, for example, protein intake or lower protein intake or more dietary restrictions as a mean to maintain the adequate phosphorus levels uh, because even though maybe that is no um, definite evidence, I'm certainly more of a fan of uh, liberalizing diet and um, prescribing more binders or the same dose of binders, especially if, it is, if patients are actually taking them. We uh, have published recently the issue of lack of adherence with phosphate binders. So perhaps just continuing to increase the prescription is really not the answer. Uh, first, we need to ensure that patients are actually taking what they're being prescribed. Um, this was it for this section of my talk, so we can move on to the next presenter.